Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney Anderson. I decided to end my decade-long love affair with alcohol in 2012 at 29 years old. I chose to live openly as a recovering alcoholic with honesty and humor while figuring it out one day at a time. This space will bring you weekly episodes of my own personal experiences with my addiction and sobriety, as well as me interviewing incredible souls who are living life without drugs and alcohol. This podcast is here to inspire you, empower you, uplift you, and bring you some laughter along the way in your own journey. Sit back, relax, and let's have a time. Welcome to the Sober Vibes Podcast. I am your host, Courtney Anderson. You are listening to episode 51. Before I explain who is on today's podcast, uh, last week's episode, I believe I said in the podcast, I was talking about my fertility journey, and I believe I referenced the book, The Universe Has Your Back, but it was super attractor. If you listen, I was talking about wild turkeys and my fertility journey and all of that. So I think I referenced um, The Universe Has Your Back, and it's in Super Attractor. And if I got it right, then cool. And if you have not listened to that episode yet, NBD, okay? So (laughs) also, too, if you have not joined my Sober Focus coaching group, monthly coaching group, Feel free to go ahead and look at that. The link is in the show notes, or you can visit CourtneyRecovered.com. I do four meetings in a month. There's a workshop. Um, if you're sober, curious, or if you're a couple, you know, a couple months into your sobriety, looking for more healing uh, tools and support and some accountability, feel free to check that out. Of course, it's for women only. So today's guest. This was such a beautiful conversation, and it's so wonderful what Eve Goldberg is doing for people in sobriety uh, and recovery with her nonprofit called Big Vision. And Big Vision is the missing link that helps sustain recovery by providing experiences, lifestyle, and community, which is great because I will tell you that is one of the hardest things once you get sober where you can find a group of people and have sober experiences and, you know, find people you can connect with by still being social and having that. Um, And this nonprofit was, did come out of Eve's son's passing, who did die of an an accidental drug drug overdose. So Eve shares her insight of being a mother too, um, of, of an addict and somebody who's sick. But I really appreciate what she does and how she honors Isaac's memory, and how she talks about him. So this is an emotional interview, but it's one worth listening to, because she is a very wise, strong woman, and if you are a mother of uh, an addict or an alcoholic, this is definitely one for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Eve, welcome to the show. Hey, Courtney. I am so very happy you are here and you are going to share uh, your story today and the vision behind Big Vision New York. I love what you guys do over there. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your backstory? Sure. So my backstory, I have been in a family business now, a family for-profit business for the past, oh, I don't know, 35 years. And I have two children. I had two children, my son, Isaac who passed away from an accidental overdose at age 23, which was seven years ago. And I have a daughter, Beatrice, who is 28 years old and getting married in June, I might say, which is very exciting. It is exciting. Something Mm -hmm. positive to Mm -hmm. look forward to. Trust me. So when Isaac struggled from when he was a little boy, he had learning issues. He had OCD. He he always struggled with his self, never had a good self-image. He was a beautiful, smart, funny little boy turned into a young man, Mm -hmm. but just didn't see himself as he really was. And Mm -hmm. and honestly, didn't really 
love himself as he should have. And he got into drugs when he was end of high school. He happened to have been a great basketball player and we had hoped he was going to play division three basketball. He started getting high with it. I did not know it at the time. I thought that playing basketball, you know, being athletic would keep him away from all of this. But you would think, right? right. It does help, but he was getting high probably with a lot of the guys on the team with him and just started down a bad path and then went to college and continued with his substance abuse and drinking. And he was in the fraternity and it just, things went down this really bad road pretty quickly. And he he struggled. He was in and out of treatment. I mean, I can get into more of the story, some of the more details of it. But when he was 23, after six, probably living home for maybe six weeks, but he was a couple of months out of sober living, Mm -hmm. not even a couple of months, probably a month and a half out of sober living. He died. He didn't die right away, but I found him one morning. I was on my way to the gym. And when knocked on his door and when he didn't answer and he was literally like right behind uh, our bedroom and I went in there and he was unresponsive and he ended up being in a coma for mm-hmm. six weeks. And it was the most horrific six weeks of my life, going to the hospital every single day and just hoping and praying for a miracle. Right. And at the end, sadly, he passed away. So... When we were sitting Shiva, as we do, I'm, I come from a traditional Jewish family. So mm-hmm. Right after the person dies at the funeral, we sit Shiva for seven days. And every person that came in, I said, I'm going to do something to make meaning out of his life. Okay. And many people said to me, I'll help you. I'll be there for you. Whatever you need, Eve, I'm there for you. And I would go into my room and keep a list. I kept a running list on a big legal pad of all the people who said they would help. Like, it's so not like me because I'm not the kind of person that ever asks for help. Yes. But I thought, this is my time. I'm asking. So I woke up one day and I said to my husband, I have my big idea. And he said, what the hell? You're, you're, in, a, you're in a business. You, what do you need a big idea for? You don't, you're running a business now. And I said, no, I'm gonna, I know what I want to do. And I said, one of the things that Isaac struggled with amongst many things, but then he had no friends to hang out with. He had nowhere to go, nothing to do. And so I said, I want to do something. I want to do something for other young adults like Isaac yes. and help them, help them stay on a good path. And that is really how Big Vision was born. Which is beautiful. And as I said, what you guys are doing there is absolutely wonderful, especially too in that age bracket, because that is a huge thing of being able to socialize and go to events and have that type of community behind you. Because once you get out of rehab or sober living, you're in a bubble. And then you have to get out into the real world and figure that out and meet people who are not using anymore. So it's wonderful. And I, you did turn something very tragic into something very beautiful. Thank you. It's, it was never in my life. I always wanted, you know, I was always charitable. I come from a family. My father was very charitable, always worked with different organizations and believed not only in giving money, but giving of his time. And over the years, I've had organizations I'm involved with, but I always wanted some way to give back, something that really had meaning for me. Now, the last thing I expected was that this was going to be to honor my, my son who passed away. That was like the last thought I ever had. Wish I didn't have to start this. Mm -hmm. I wish this had existed for Isaac. It gives me a lot of strength to do this and to work with the young adults who come to our big vision events and just, and see their progress and see how they develop. Some, we obviously, since COVID, it's been quite different because we haven't been able to have all these in-person events, but we used to have them a couple of months. And I would see these people and the first time they would show up, you could see like they were so like shy, introverted, didn't feel comfortable in their skin because they were very early in their recovery. Most of them, that's really where we would get people from sober living or from these therapeutic communities. And so they were really early in their recovery. And you can see it was like deer in the headlights. So they didn't know what they were doing, where they were. And then the next one and the next one, they became like family and they would walk in and see other people that they knew and it's like, hey, how you doing? And they see each other at meetings and then come to these big vision events. And it really, we have this community that we've created 
of young adults who are you know, in different stages of recovery. And we believe that there are multiple paths to recovery. There's yes. no one size fits all. So it's not, oh, they all go to AA. We're fine. We've developed recovery lifestyle standards and practices that are evidence-based to sustain sobriety. So we're all about lifestyle. It's not, we're not about getting you sober because you can get sober. We all, we know that you go to treatment, you're going to get sober, but then what happens? You come out and it's okay. What the hell do I do now? And especially if you're 20 something years old and you're used to being a very social animal and being with a lot of friends and hanging out and getting high and whatever, it's like, how do I have fun again? That seems to be all people do, you know, even as kids, as adults, your first time you walk into someone's house or a party, what's the first thing someone says? Can I get you, you a drink? Can yeah. I get you a drink? And then you know? when, if it's like, oh, I'll just take a water. Oh, you don't, let's get you a back go. It's no, yes, yes. Right. Very. It's like, it's difficult. And to, as it, at my age now, I don't care what people say. And I'm okay with being different or standing out, or whatever it is. But when you're 20 something years old, you want to like every. You don't want anybody to say, oh, like she's not drinking. Why is she not drinking? You know, it's none of your business why I'm not drinking, quite honestly. Well, <laughs> and, yeah. and then too, with Isaac's age group of t- that early 20s, that's very hard. Very hard. It's so hard. And this was Isaac passed away and it's seven years ago now, which by the way, when I say that, I don't even believe it because it might as well have been yesterday. Right. It might as well have been yesterday. It, I just, I still expect him to walk in the door to just whatever. It's not normal to lose a child. It's not, it's just not, my mother always said that. Like when I was growing up, she always said, it's not the way it's supposed to be. When she was talking about other people, she knew who had lost a child. Mm-hmm. It's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to to go first. Your child's not supposed to go first. It's not right. And it's it's so unacceptable. It's still hard for me to accept it, but it's been seven years and seven, eight years ago when he was really struggling nine years ago, people, were you doing a podcast eight years ago? No, I, I was just getting sober eight years ago. <laughs> yeah. How many people were doing podcasts about sobriety? Well, there, well, there were no podcasts, but I don't know when the podcasts even started, but Within the past couple of years, same thing with social media. The social media thing really has taken off more within like the past couple of years of it. So it's just all we knew eight years ago was rehab or the rooms. There was not, you didn't hear about anything else besides that. Of That's how the only way to treat this disease. And people like, I have a lot of friends who have know nothing. Now they know a lot about it this recovery world. They knew nothing before Isaac passed away and before I started Big Vision. And they are, they all thought like everybody thinks 28 days. This is what I thought when Isaac went into treatment. I was like 28 days. Oh God, great. He comes home. He's good. We're good to go. You're cured. And we realized that treatment and therapy are critical, Yes, but the system is broken and lifestyle frequently has a greater impact on sobriety than anything else. Yes, it's it, it's just and people don't realize that. And I feel like I'm always, you know, telling people I have parents who come to me and their, their kids have to go into treatment. And I'm like, OK, remember, you have to figure out what's going to happen after treatment. That is the aftercare is so key. And for us, we just we feel big vision needs to be part of every aftercare plan. It's like when Isaac left treatment, they said, OK, here's what you have to do. You need a therapist. You need to go to meetings. You need to go back to work or school or whatever it is Mm -hmm. and done. And it was like, okay, that's not enough. You got to give them a way to live their lives again and have fun again and learn how to be a person, but just a sober person, just how to live. Right. And that is one thing too, that I hear, I help women. And that is the number one thing that I hear. Will I be fun? What will my friends think? And these are women who are 40 years and up. So that fear is there for people of all ages. Yes. And then when it comes to it, it is a thing of, it's just like drugs and alcohol. It's not fun at the end of it. It's just like, A lot of my days were not fun of how I experienced my own addiction. It seems like fun at the time, but the next day when you wake up and 
You don't really remember what you did, who you did it with, or right. where you were, and you feel like crap. It's was that really worth it? Was that really fun? And I went. I stopped. I don't. I never had an issue with alcohol, but I don't know. It's I don't know how many years now where I stopped drinking. I just mm-hmm. I said to myself, I have to. I all I do is talk about like living life sober. And you know what? Even though I'm not a young adult, I still want to. I want to experience it, and I want to see. What it's like. Am I going to have fun if I go to a party and I don't drink, go to someone's house and don't drink, go to my daughter's wedding and I'm not going to drink? And guess what? I'm I'm so happy, mm-hmm. so much happier. I feel so much clearer, so much better, healthier, everything. And it's I nobody really some people question. They do question and people are like, oh, I have one shot. And you know what? I don't want to take a shot. <laughs> yeah. When I, I was three years sober, when I got married and I had people ask me after they're like, so you didn't even have one glass of champagne at your wedding. I'm like, no, because <laughs> that one glass of champagne yeah. would have turned into me having a blackout. And then my husband filing for divorce the next day. Because that's where that where that's where some people it leads to not everybody, but it's just people don't understand that it's okay not to drink. It's right. okay. It is not the end of the world. So mm-hmm. I'm just very happy more people are talking about it and talking about it. So for you, after losing Isaac, which for me, I'm pregnant with my first child right now. Oh, who is, that's amazing. <laughs> thank you. Who, who, he's a boy. Aww. And you talking about this, it chokes me up because I just, as you said, it's not natural to lose a child before no before you in your lifetime. So how have you been coping? Just in case anybody's listening who is a mother of a son or daughter who's passed away because of addiction. It's been very, it's every day is a challenge. I'm not going to lie, like sugarcoated and say, I'm fine. I'm a very strong person. And I come from a line of strong women. My mother is just turned 91 yesterday and she's amazing. And she, when my dad died, I remember it's very different, obviously, but I still remember her just saying, I said, what do we do now? We sat shiver for a week. Mm -hmm. And then there's a custom where you walk around the block afterwards and the family walks around the block. And then the mourning period that of that week is over. And I remember I said, mom, what do we do now? I don't know. What do I do? And she said, we're going to walk around the block. I'm going to shower, go to the gym, and then we'll go into the office. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And I was (laughs) going home and getting in bed. Right. Like my mom time was 70 something. I'm like, she's going to the office. How do I let her go to the office? And I'm not going to go. So that's, I was always taught to put one foot in front of the other. And listen, I was never taught what to do if you lose a child because you don't think about it. It's unthinkable. It's unacceptable. It's it's un everything. It's unnatural. I can give you a million different words for it, but I, for me, helping other people as cliche as that might sound, Mm -hmm. but helping other people is what gets me through the day. It really, it's knowing that big vision is helping people, even if I'm not directly there with the people, but my staff is, or just through social media or whatever it is, helping people and knowing that we're making a difference helps me so much. And, and so I'm able to like, think about Isaac every single day mm-hmm. and, and speak his name. And I, I talk about him. And that's one thing when you lose a child, people at first are, are a little weird when mm-hmm. you talk to them, they don't really know how to accept, how to take it. Like I remember right after Isaac died, a few months later, I had dinner with this couple and I said, Oh, we were having sushi. And I'm like, Oh my God, sushi was, that was Isaac's favorite food. He loves sushi. And I can see their backs, like the hairs on their back standing up. Like they didn't know yeah. what to say, how to respond to it. It's okay. You have to talk about it. And what, if you make other people feel uncomfortable too bad, it's not your problem. You have to be able to, to, to speak about your child because it's still your child. You gave birth to this child. He's going to be, he's my child forever. There's always the question when people say, how many children do you have? I, all my, I have many friends now, sadly, who are part of this club who have lost a child. And we all talk about it. What do you say when somebody asks you how many children you have? Did you want to start explaining? I have two, but I I had two. Now I have one. It depends on the crowd. If it's a business dinner, you may not bring it up, but I do sometimes. I don't care. But but that's how it should be because, you know, death is very uncomfortable for people. And then especially too, when it's a child, I think. And by the way, sorry, saying that your child, I always say that he died of an accidental drug overdose. I, 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 I put it out there right away. 
that's how he died. I'm not going to sugar. I'm not going to pretend. Oh, he some people. Oh, he had an aneurysm. Like people say things like that because they. they yeah. Like, no, this is a, a, a horrific disease that is killing people every day. Young adults, older people, everything, and and we need to talk about it, and we need to make people feel like it's okay. It's okay to talk about it. It's good to talk about it. And I think that is the thing. It goes back into the parent shame of thinking that maybe they did something wrong. And, but it's, I don't want to overstep here, but it's something that, that is addiction is a disease. Totally. Listen, there are, I still have days. I had many days that I, all I did was blame myself. Mm-hmm. What could I have done differently? There's about, there's about a million things I could have done differently, but I'll never know that those things could have made a difference. I can, you can't go back and say, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Doesn't mean he would be alive today. You don't know. I, there was a lot of blaming of myself, very much so. Even to this day, I can't help it. Sometimes I go there and my husband looks at me and he's just, don't even, don't go there. Don't go there. Mm-hmm. You, you couldn't have done anything different. I brought my mom on this podcast last year and she did say at one point, she was like, by the time you guys got to a certain age, me and my sister, she was like, I had to just let you guys go. She yeah. said, I couldn't control that situation anymore. And I just had to pray to God, you guys would be safe. And I was always here for you. And that's the thing for me, being a, an addict with alcohol that eventually led into drug use, there was nothing anybody could do. There was nothing my parents could do. There was, I was going to do what I was going to do until I had my own moment of this was enough. By the way, thank you for saying that. Oh, you're that, right. what, that helps me. But it's 100% the honest truth. Mm-hmm. Same thing. My, my sister was into crack for a couple of years in which my sister comes on the show and we talk about this. So I'm not outing my sister, but same thing for her. It was just to the point of you can't have, your parents can't do it all for you. So it just comes to a point where you have to have your own rock bottom. And unfortunately for your son and millions of others who pass away from an accidental overdose, that happens. That happens. And you know what? I have parents who reach out to me because we're very much about, we want to also help the the stakeholders, the families, the Mm -hmm. significant others. We want to help them navigate the challenges of sobriety and break down the stigmatizations and empower people. And I think one of the things that's really hard. And they, I hear them saying, today was a good day. Today was a good day. I said, you know what? I remember going to family week at Karen. And I remember that the word roller coaster being used a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's, you can't keep going on that roller coaster with your child. You can't because you, you got to get help. And that's my first thing I say to these parents, you got to help yourself. You, you can't control what's going to happen with your child. I am the perfect example of that. As much as I wanted to keep Isaac alive, I want, I felt I was doing all the right things at the end. It's just out of your control. You can't fix it. They have to want to be fixed. They have to work on it. And I'm always telling parents to get help for themselves, live your life. It's exactly what your mother said. At a certain point, you have to like, you got to let them go. It's you're so afraid. Oh, if I let them go, they might die. Guess what? If you don't let them go, they also might die. That's true. They could also, I might die in a car accident. So it's just, it is one of those things. So going into that though, what was Isaac's drug of choice? So Isaac's drug of what he wasn't, I don't think he was really that, it was opioids. He wasn't, at the end of the day, I remember when I found him that morning, I found some pills and it was, I looked it up and it was methadone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, methadone? But the, why was he taking methadone? But it, mm-hmm. it didn't matter. He, I feel like he took whatever he could get. And uh, at the very end, you know, when he was, it was so crazy because he was, it was in the hospital for three different places for six weeks. And I remember he was at this place, Care One in New Jersey. It was, it's more of a, but I remember the doctor coming in and taking a look. He had these like br- kind of bruises on his legs. And we never quite figured out what it was. And he said, oh, he was uh, doing heroin. Mm-hmm. And I looked at him and my friend was with me. And here I am. My son is practically gone. Mm-hmm. And it's been weeks that he's in the hospital. 
And when he said that, I looked at him and I was like, no, no. I said, no, he, no, he never did. He didn't do heroin. He wasn't shooting up enough. And the doctor looked at me and was like, oh, okay, whatever. It doesn't really make a difference what it was. And when he walked away, my friend and I looked at each other and we, I actually started la- laughing to crying. But just, I said, what do I, why am I like, all of a sudden the stigma of that he might've been doing heroin was like, I wasn't going to admit that. Here he's mm-hmm. dying in a hospital, but no, he didn't do heroin. It was like, it was so crazy. I realized how ridiculous I was. You know what? He might have like, also when I was at family week, I remember finding out that the reason why they start, you know, shooting up is because it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. He couldn't afford his habit anymore. He was t- you know, taking 20 pills a day. God knows what it was costing him. He was stealing money from me. He was emptying out his bank account. I remember giving him, we used to have tickets to like the Nick games to the, and he would sell the tickets if he wanted to go and he would take the tickets and sell them. Right. I, did I know at the time that he was doing that? I thought he went to the game. I found out that all these things later on, but it's a crazy disease. It makes people do things. Isaac was such a good boy. He was so kind and compassionate and he just, it's, he, it wasn't him. I always said it, it wasn't him speaking. It was the addiction at a certain point because all Isaac wanted to do, he cared about people. He was, when we sat Shiva, I remember they came from his sober living. They actually, a group of them, the counselor called me and said, we want to come over and we want to pay you a, a Shiva call. And I said, okay. And we did it at a time when no one else was there and 12 kids showed up with this counselor and they all told me stories because Isaac had just lived there. And they all told me stories about him and telling me, half of them told me, if it weren't for Isaac, I wouldn't be sober. Isaac helped me. Isaac this, Isaac that. Like that was Isaac helping other people. He was just so kind. And when I remember Isaac saying to me weeks before he he passed away, just saying to me, you know what, mom, I'm never going to do drugs again because I know how quickly I will go down. He says, it'll take me to a dark place. And I know how quickly I'll go to that dark place. And I never want to be there again. And there he went. That tells you everything. To me, that said everything about this disease. He he didn't want it. It's not what he wanted. No, that's not. And I have said that before of when, with people ask me about drinking and stuff, I'm like, I, I can't do a relapse because that will kill me. Yeah. I just, that one drink will eventually kill me because that's what, but that's, the addiction for me was a slow suicide. And anytime I picked up a drink, it was like, what I was gambling with my life. Totally. Yep. So what's I, what was Isaac's favorite color? His favorite color mm-hmm. was blue. Blue. Okay. Why? I just wanted to, I just wanted to know just to get to know him a little bit more of he loved basketball and his favorite color was blue and he was a very kind soul. I'll tell you just a perfect story. I actually at Isaac's funeral, I got up and spoke. Don't ask me how right. I did it to this day. It's an outer body experience because I don't know how I had the strength, the, the strength to get up there and speak. Mm-hmm. But I told the story about Isaac, which just said everything about Isaac. So it was his 21st birthday. And I said, what do you want to do for your 21st birthday? And he said, I want to go away. I want to take the two guys in my fraternity who have never gone on vacation in their lives. And I want to take them with me. I want to go on vacation. And I was like, really? Where do you want to go? And this Caribbean, whatever. A lot of the places I'm looking at, you need a passport. He's no mom. These kids don't have passports. They've literally never been anywhere. But Isaac lived a pretty privileged life. We vacation, whatever normal, what normal yeah. was for our world. We went on vacations, went school vacations and whatever. And he came home from school with these two guys. And I remember we were sitting in the dining room having dinner and they walked in the door and we looked at these kids and they were like, literally like country bumpkins. We lived in New York city. We were like, he was like the city and he's this tall, really good looking guy, Isaac. And they were these two literally like they had like hay in their teeth. They were country bumpkins. We were hysterical laughing and they're like, wow, that's so cool. We came up to your apartment in an elevator. And I was like, they said, I thought only hotels have elevators. And we were just, we were dying. And th- these are the two kids that Isaac chose to take on his 21st birthday vacation what was on the outside. Didn't matter what someone looked like, didn't matter where they came from, had money, didn't have money, education, no education, didn't matter, did not care. He just, he liked you for for who you are. He was very genuine. It was 
He sounds like it. So what are some key elements if you want to give a couple to our listeners needed to live a sober lifestyle? Because again, that is huge for people's recovery of staying sober, I would say. I think what's so important is to find a community of people that you can be with, find a sober community or even just one or two sober friends and just be, just learn to develop meaningful relationships with people with no substances, obviously. And there's so many elements to it. One, obviously, is you have to live a, besides just not doing drugs and alcohol, that's just one thing, but you have to stay active. Mm -hmm. It's so important to stay active. It's so important to eat well, important to do, you know, activities, whatever it is, find fun things to do in your own city. Like for instance, Suzanne, who works for us and does all of our social media, she's just always showing people, she goes on a bike ride, she goes and discovers a new neighborhood, a new restaurant, whatever, even if she's doing it alone, but just get out there and do things and just just have fun. And really, I think it's very important that the family be a part of this process because you cannot, if you have a close family relationship, there's just no way you, you have to include your family. You have to engage your family with this and show them why it's so important to have this sober lifestyle and show them what it's about. Also, it's just show them what kind of support that you need in order to live this lifestyle. But I think people don't get it. Even family members don't really understand it. And I think that we need to educate them and just keep, help them. What was that movie? Help me help you. But help oh. them, teach them how they, what was that from? I think it was Jerry Maguire, wasn't it? When he was Jerry like, Maguire, help- yes. <laughs> Terry McGuire. And I think that one of the really important things is that recovery is not like pass fail. It's like there are challenges along the way. And this is a journey. This is not like just like today. It is just today. Think about today. Obviously, I don't need to like teach people like one day at a time, but Mm -hmm. I say it to everybody, whether you're in recovery, not in recovery. It's just worry about today. And this is a journey and it's not simple. And we have to like really embrace the struggles along the way and just find ways to navigate these challenges of sobriety. And listen, on on our Instagram, bigvision.nyc is our website, bigvisionnyc on Instagram. We show all the different ways, whether it's doing yoga on Monday mornings or we do craft uh, night on Tuesday nights or a lot of things that you can join that are not in-person events that will just help you stay on a good path. Yeah. Last year you guys did, it was over the summer and I thought it was so cool. You guys did like a dance party. Yeah. We're going to do another one. Yep. Okay. I I will be joining that one, but I just thought that was so cool and just like fun. And yeah. that's, it, it's okay to show up and be silly. And of course that was virtual, but it's just, it's something to get outside of yourself and what everybody needs in life everybody, every human being needs more playtime with going back to their like inner child. You need more playtime in your adult life. And that I thought was something that was just fun. 100%. Some of the activities we do, like we do trapeze, we do go-karting. You know, these are in-person events, but these are things that there are so many things that you can do that you would do sober, that you don't involve having a cocktail. You don't involve going to a bar. There's just so many things out there. You just have to find them. You have to look for them. And and if you have friends who are not sober, it doesn't mean that you can't hang out with them. They just have to understand where you're coming from and really educate them as, as to like how to be your friend and how to be supportive. I think it's really important. We have to educate people because people just don't get it. And I probably wouldn't be speaking about this and wouldn't get it if it weren't for Isaac. I'd be one of those people. We really need to to help people understand, you know, what this is a real struggle for a lot of people, a lot of people. I appreciate you for talking about your son and keeping his memory alive and doing something good. His memory in in him is helping so many others. Like, I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) it's It's a huge impact. So anytime I see the color blue now, I will think of Isaac. Okay, that's sweet. You're going to think about him a lot. Thank you so much, Eve, for sharing your story and again, keeping Isaac's memory alive and sharing about that journey with him. Again, people can find you 
on Instagram and your website. Do you want to say those two real quick again? Bigvision.nyc is the website and bigvisionnyc is the Instagram handle. Okay, perfect. And then yeah. and then I will link all of of those links in the show notes so can so people can reach out if they need to. Okay, and, and we are a nonprofit, so just mm-hmm. if we need donations in order to keep going, all of our events are for free. So that's another thing. Just always have to throw that out there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Eve. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. You too. Bye-bye.